Hello, my name is John Williams, and I'm an associate professor of English at Yale University, and the author of the essay World Futures, appearing in the spring 2016 issue of Critical Inquiry. I'm also the author of The Buddha in the Machine, Art, Technology, and the Meeting of East and West, published by Yale University Press in 2014, and currently a work on a new project titled The Oracles of World Time. In this video, which it might be useful to think of as a kind of informal voiceover for the published article, I'd like to provide some additional illustrations and context for several of the figures and events I analyze in the essay, which I'm hoping you've read since this video will make much more sense if you have. One artist whose work I did not have time or space to allude to in the print version is Suzanne Treister, who has created a brilliant series of artistic mandalas and tarot card-like images she calls Hexen 2.0 that evokes precisely the spiritualist ethos of the world futures discourse I'm describing. As you can see in these images, her goal seems to be to map the networked origins of the digital universe in an aesthetic reminiscent of esoteric hermeticism, occult magic, and sacred geometry, and so on. There's something vaguely paranoid in the overall effect, but it's also extremely brilliant and provocative. Here, for instance, you can see Stuart Brand standing over a kind of whole earth diagrammatic shape, something like one of Buckminster Fuller's geodesic structures, labeled here underneath as the conceptual forerunner to the World Wide Web. And there are similar diagrammatic illustrations of Web 2.0, global finance markets, and economic cybernetics. While in this image, you can see the attendees of the original Macy conferences on cybernetics in the 1950s portrayed as engaged in a kind of spiritualist seance. Her drawing for Stafford Beer is especially interesting as it aptly illustrates the degree to which his commitment to esoterica and mystical sensibilities informed his entire approach to cybernetic systems and management theories. Photographs of Stafford Beer late in his life, which I couldn't include in the essay but that you can see here, also demonstrate just how much he had embraced what he called this ancient yogic oriental temporality. Now, one thing to note is that this Orientalist sensibility played out somewhat complicatedly in Stafford Beer's poetry. On the one hand, for instance, Beer seems to have been convinced that his artistic and cybernetic endeavors were consistent with the ideographic poetics of Ezra Pound. In his 1983 collection of poetry, Transit, for example, Beer titles the final section One Person Metagame, a 30th draft of Cantos, referring to it as a cheery salute to Ezra Pound. In fact, much of Beer's creative work seems to have been crafted as an implicit homage to Pound, including, for example, the name for his alter ego later in life, Wizard Prang, which, if you pronounce it a certain way, almost sounds like a homonymic approximation of Ezra Pound. And if you search online, you can read The Chronicles of Wizard Prang, which he wrote under that pseudonym. But there's also the irreverent Cantos-like style of many of his management writings, including things like all caps, emphases, uh, poetic enjambments, esoteric allusions, and colorful high modernist designs. Basically all the trappings of what we have come to recognize as Poundian aesthetics. But in terms of tone, there's also an explicitly mystical and yogic quality in Beer's poetry, which places him right at home with the countercultural Eastern aesthetics of contemporary figures like Alan Watts and Richard Braudigan, Chogyam Trungpa, Gary Snyder, and so on. Notice, for example, the all-things-are-systems notion that seems to permeate his aptly titled 1964 poem, Computer, the Irish Sea. He writes, That green computer sea, with all its molecular logic, to the system's square inch, a bigger brain than mine, writes out foamy equations from the bow, across the bland blackboard water, accounting for variables which navigators cannot even list, a bigger sum than theirs, getting the answer continuously right, without fail and without anguish, integrals white on green. Cursively writes, recursively computes that green computer C, on a scale so shocking that all the people sit dumbfounded, throwing indigestible peel at seagulls, not uttering an equation between them. All this liquid diaphantine stuff of order umpteen million is its own analog. Take a turn around the deck and understand the mystery by which what happens writes out its explanation as it goes. The central image here that the Irish Sea is itself a calculative system composed of liquid diaphantine stuff, uh, diaphantine being a term that refers to polynomial equations, 
and operating on a scale so shocking that all people sit dumbfounded, is designed to invoke a kind of computationalist sublime, in which the astronomical, unimaginable power of nature's calculations becomes a sort of Buddhist complex, infinite and fractal, part of what must surround us at every moment. And it's precisely this computational sublimity, this infinite algorithmic matrix that makes the idea of singular futurity as an operational concept so problematic for Beer. I also mention in the essay that Beer became fascinated by the occult temporalities of the Enneagram, and in his artistic work he also talked about the possibility of making a ring of paintings that would act as a mandala, and as you can see in the instructions that were given to visitors scrolling down the right hand side of the screen here, when the paintings were actually exhibited in Liverpool in 1992, nine of his paintings were arranged in enneagrammatic form. And he noted again in reference to his favorite mathematical expression, the idea was to create n times n minus 1 directional relationships between n paintings. Now, given Stafford Beer's effort to extend what he saw as the poetic legacy of Ezra Pound, it might also be interesting to note that the next figure I describe in my article, Buckminster Fuller in his World Game, similarly claimed an affinity for the Orientalist visions of Ezra Pound, whom he actually met while giving a series of lectures in Venice in 1971. And when Fuller was invited a few years later to deliver the annual Pound lectures at the University of Idaho, he specifically argued that when Ezra Pound went back into the Chinese ideographs, what he found was the behavior of whole system unpredicted by the behavior of any of the parts considered separately, which is of course to say synergy. As is evident already in his invitation to give the Pound lectures, many of Fuller's commentators and biographers were convinced that he was indeed the heir to the modernist aesthetics that Hugh Kenner had labeled the Pound era. And certainly no one did more to strengthen that assumption than Kenner himself. In his glowing volume Bucky, A Guided Tour of Buckminster Fuller, published in 1973 for instance, Kenner credits Fuller with having provided the interdisciplinary inspiration he needed to begin writing his own treatise on modernist poetics. After hearing a talk from Fuller on nature's coordinate system, Kenner explains, This talk solved for me that week a book called The Pound Era I had been trying to think out for years and was suddenly able to start writing. Validation of Fuller's lineage in Pound Era modernism similarly came in the form of an endowed position at Harvard, the Charles Eliot Norton Chair of Poetry in 1962, the same chair occupied previously by poets like Robert Frost, T.S. Eliot, and E.E. E. Cummings. Fuller, of course, is not typically remembered for his poetry, which he often referred to as ventilated prose, but it is worth noting that much of the new pluralist futurity he was advocating was very clear in his poetry. As you can see in the lines I have italicized and highlighted here in his poem Intuition, the idea of unpredictable synergy in his scenario universe really saturates his thinking. I won't read the whole thing, but you can see that the entire poem might have been subtitled An Epic of Universal Unpredictability, as Fuller does not stop with the above iterations, but goes on to describe successive layers of synergistic unpredictability in various levels of tissues, regenerative organisms, and so on, as he says, through all the macro and micro aspects of the universe. Something else I could only allude to in the article is the degree to which Buckminster Fuller's metaphysical vision of pluralist futurity reflected that of the Enneagram and its primary guru, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who it turns out met frequently with Fuller in New York in the 1930s. In fact, as Jonathan Massey has recently shown in a really wonderful book, Fuller borrowed directly a great deal, both architecturally and metaphysically, from Claude Bragdon, who was the architect, designer, and translator of Gurdjieff's star pupil, P.D. Ospensky. And it was Ospensky's work that really promoted Gurdjieff and the Enneagram in England and in the U.S. It's really almost uncanny how much Fuller and Bragdon were on the same page when it came to the transcendent powers of symmetrical three-dimensional geometry and the occult wisdom of the ancient East. In fact, all the Orientalist origins and geometrical forms that Fuller would go on to popularize throughout his career are present already in Bragdon, from the unfolded icosahedral projection that Fuller would use for the Damaxian map to the three-dimensional buckyball structures that Fuller would use for his geodesic revolution. Uh, you can even see it already in Bragdon's use of the character Sinbad as an allegorical figure to illustrate his journey through a land of sacred geometry.
Sinbad, of course, is a character in the Thousand and One Nights, which if you've read my essay, you will notice uh, occurs as a kind of recurring motif in the discourse on world futures. It was even a favorite of think tank gurus like Herman Kahn. And speaking of Herman Kahn... Yes, I would like to open the, the questions now to the ring. Uh, but before we start with the ring, uh, I would like to say that we received uh, uh, a telegram uh, from Herman Kahn. Uh, I, I was hoping that we would be able to get him on the telephone, but unfortunately he is involved in government meetings uh, at this time. And uh, his question was along the lines of, what will a fully human being look like in the post-industrial era? And I'm sure he means that in all the very fullest senses. The post-industrial person, what will he look like? I mean, after we have gotten along well into such a, a thing as this type of electronic revolution. Which questions have disappeared? Is all speech interrogative? What you're seeing here is an excerpt from James Lee Byers' World Question Center, which, as I describe in the article, involved a kind of televised cold calling in which Byers, from within this quasi-sacred ring of people in a collective garment, telephones various people around the world and asks them if they could offer him a question regarding their own personal sense of the evolution of knowledge. Hello. 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 Yes, we're looking for questions that are particularly important for your own personal evolution of knowledge. Could you offer us a question like that on the phone? Here, for example, he's calling Dr. Robert Jung, a futurologist best known for the invention of a futures generating technique known as the Futures Workshop. Dr. Jung? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, not very well. As you know, I'm uh, James Lee Byers and the South Yes, Accord I know. Yes. Would you, would you offer us a question that you feel is pertinent? Uh, in regards to your own evolution of knowledge by phone now? Yes. I Please. don't know. I have no idea what you wanted to know. Well, I, I would like to, to know a question, as I've just said, that you feel is very important to you in oh. regards to your own personal involvement with the yes. area that you think you know the most about. Well, I would say that the most important question for me is how uh, we could uh, enhance imagination. I feel imagination is, uh, is in chains now. And we don't I, I beg your, to free it. I beg your pardon, could you speak a little closer? I can't. I see, I see. For me. The reason to zoom in on this somewhat weird piece of performance art is to illustrate the point of convergence that I allude to in my essay between the high-octane intellectual atmosphere of the Cold War think tank and a series of developments in the art world, particularly the work associated with avant-garde developments like the Art and Technology Program at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in the late 1960s. Luciano? Hello? Hel Luciano? Yes, I don't hear it. Yes, we are, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, uh, try to talk as loud as possible, please. We are looking for questions. Byers, as an homage to Herman Kahn, is rather consciously deploying an aesthetic that he found in Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, which very famously used Herman Kahn as the model for the titular character. Hello, De uh, hello Dimitri. Listen, I, I can't hear too well. Do you suppose you could turn the music down just a little? You can see the obvious visual references in these screenshots side by side. As simply as possible on the questions. I mean, as tersely as possible. Am I coming through? Yes, you are. But Byers is not the only connection between the world of scenario planning as it emerged in various speculative reports at places like the Rand Corporation and the Hudson Institute. Um, and here on the screen you can see a couple of the scenarios written for NASA by the Hudson Institute in the mid-1980s. The term scenario was also consciously adopted by the avant-garde art world as a way of describing the overarching ethos of performative art. Here you can see the long list of participants for a volume titled Scenarios, put together by the New York artist Richard Costellanets in 1980. And among them are all of the luminaries of the 1960s and 1970s performance art. Uh, people like Jackson Mack Lowe, Nam June Pike, John Cage, Allison Knowles, and collectives like Fluxus and Living Theater. Inside the collection there are scripts for happenings, poems, uh, plays, diagrammatic illustrations for performance pieces, works of notation, uh, and a great many of these, of course, invoke the aesthetics of Eastern mysticism as a correlative form of this particular scenario thinking. 
One of the most provocative and canny contributions to the scenario's volume was literary critic Ihab Hassan's script for a performance piece on what he called the paratextual development of posthumanism. Just a few years before writing the scenario's script, Hassan had commented specifically on the scenario as something that ought to concern literary scholars. Futurology thrives, he writes. Its devotees range from scientists of the RAND Corporation to science fiction writers, from militarists to occultists. Institutes for the study of the future fill our space, and periodicals like The Futurist, Futures, and Changes extend our time. The scenario has become the thing. Note departments of literature. Here lies a new field. How will the verbal imagination sow its seed? As I explain in my essay, one of the most powerful institutions where those seeds were sown was Shell Oil. Certainly Shell has become the most famous and famously rewarded for their development of the scenario planning technique as a mode of projecting forward. On my own website, which I'll link to in the description of this video, I'll include links where you can read the shorter public versions of Shell's global scenarios dating back to 1992, which you can see here. But to conclude these extra thoughts on my essay, I think as a way of illustrating just how intensely the domain of world futures has come to inform our contemporary investment in plural futurity, it might be interesting to point to a figure I did not have time to describe in the print version, but who has also been extremely influential in the development of scenario techniques and management studies. So in the article, I do talk about Pierre Vach, who was head of the scenario team at Shell in the 1970s, and really brought a great deal of prestige to the technique with his anticipation of the 1973 oil crisis, while in the early 1990s that position was held by Joseph Jaworski, whom I also describe. But the man who occupied that position during the 1980s, and who doesn't get much attention in my essay, was Peter Schwartz who would later co-found the Global Business Network and write what has become one of the most influential scenario planning manuals in business literature, The Art of the Long View, which the Association of Professional Futurists has voted the best all-time book on the future. Since his time at Shell, Schwartz has assisted in scenario production with several of the world's most influential corporations and governmental institutions, including the White House, the International Stock Exchange, Pacific Gas, Bell South, and dozens more. He's also become something of a guru of contemporary futurology, and has reportedly taken up Tibetan Buddhism as a means of sustaining that visionary mindset. In 2001, he was brought on as a consultant for Steven Spielberg's cinematic adaptation of Philip K. Dick's short story, Minority Report. While it might be difficult to guess exactly which elements of the film were Schwartz's contributions, and which would have evolved without his input, it isn't difficult to see that the film's basic message is an argument for the virtues of scenario planning. So to explain what I mean, let's examine the two primary forces of futurological thinking operating in the film. On the one hand, we have these three perpetually contemplative and mindful precogs, we could call them remarkable people, to use scenario planning terminology, who have these visions of the future that are scanned in their brains and then projected onto the ceiling of what is called the temple above them. Science has stolen most of our miracles. In a way, they give us hope. And I think it's of course significant that they are basically floating in sensory deprivation tanks that link them to the countercultural New Age visions of John Lilly, his experiments with LSD, Buddhist meditation, and so on. And it's at least a very curious coincidence that the arrangement of the precogs inside the temple has them placed along the coordinates of an enneagram. We might also point out that the mechanism by which the precog's visions are rendered legible for pre-crime law enforcement involves the production of these large wooden beads covered in glass, almost like giant glossy marbles, which I would argue is designed to invoke Herman Hesse's great utopian novel of pluralist futurity, The Glass Bead Game. And really, anyone within earshot of the countercultural fascination with temporality in the 1960s and 70s would have been intimately familiar with Hess's novel, which is, interestingly enough, the story of an oracle told in the future from multiple perspectives and multiple points in time. Oh, I love this part. One of Stafford Beer's poems, for instance, argued, Our science is the glass bead game. Window panes, aluminum extrusion, two figures resolving in the room. So overall then you've got this received counterculturalist vision of pluralist futurity, but on the other hand you have this massive institutional apparatus known as pre-crime 
that has been doing everything it can to both take advantage of this visionary futurology while simultaneously suppressing the important plurality and variety of the precog's visions. I lost my best friend. I lost my aunt. I lost my dad. I lost my father. I lost my wife. Just six years ago, the homicide rate in this country had reached epidemic proportions. It seemed that only a miracle could stop the bloodshed. But instead of one miracle, we were given three, the precognitives. Within just one month under the pre-crime program, the murder rate in the District of Columbia was reduced 90%. Pre-crime, the bureaucratic institution, wants these visions of the future to be singular, consistent, and predictable, and the journey of the protagonist, played by Tom Cruise, is basically one of converting from this futurological singularity to a vision of world futures that will allow for a contingency and pluralist narrativity. The fact that there is a minority report is just another way of saying that there is an additional alternate story about the future and that a healthier vision of the future should always involve a whole suite of conjectural narratives. And thus it is the institution's refusal to come to grips with that plurality that creates the dystopic sterility we find in the crimeless world of this particular future. Now, as a final thought, whether or not we're in a place today where we can continue to think of pluralist futurity as a virtue in and of itself is a question that I hope my essay in this video will leave open. Because of course no one wants a world of pre-crime laws and draconian futurological singularity, but I think it is certainly worth asking if there are ways in which this fascination with plurality has been capitalized on and exploited by the corporations and institutions we've been assuming were being held in check by these pluralist techniques. Thanks for watching.